Okay, so where do we want to go with this conversation? Do we want to talk about this idea? You weren't here for this, Nora. We're, we're talking about this connecting force. Seems to be the best idea that we've come up with collectively. Talking about, yeah. I don't know, we seem to be talking about, about um, <clears throat> freedom and uh, the opposite of freedom. What's yeah. that? Yeah. Totalitarian, I don't know the yeah. word, but yeah, somewhere there. Yeah. Yeah, Liberty and the and crea impossible. creativity, freedom, freedom of expression. Uh, being imprisoned in some way within a construct, within language, within yourself. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Just. I mean, how can we up the freedom? Come and have a seat on the table of chat. It's it's not that Come difficult, is it, Judy? Um. Yeah. No, I'm not going to yeah, ask I you. I'm going to ask him. Yeah. <laughs> what do you talk? Yeah. What do you just anything? Or, no. I, yeah. Well, well, I, I mean, mean that things that are going around in my head because yeah. of my it's your personal experience, isn't it? Yeah. And I know I had a I had a deciding moment when I had to decide whether to be artistic or to get some other skills which I could use for yeah. employment. So I kind of abandoned the art side. Right. You know. So then, yeah. So then, if you want to belong in society, you have to be productive. I mean, that's yeah. the whole question. So Does then, I'd love to have gone on the do I was on the yeah. dole, and I could have gone to art college, but then I had the the job center was pressuring me, and I ended up doing this admin office skills, which I've I've had to have, and I've you know I valued it because it helped me integrate. So uh, it's a question where you want to be integrated and you mm. want to be productive in, and earn money, not, okay. you know, not be on the on living on um, you know handouts or whatever. Even though if you're really mentally ill, you need that help, you know, at the time. So okay, so um, creative skills are not necessarily productive skills, and can creative be productive? We've got a new face at the table. Let me just get your name. What's your oh, name? my name's Deirdre. Was it? Deirdre. Deirdre. We've got Margot, we've got Judy, we've got Amit, we have got um, Loretta, Nora, Eve, Lucia, and I'm Mikey. Um, and I guess at the moment we're, we're kind of talking about creativity versus productivity. Um, and this kind of like, yeah. I think you said a very important thing there, and I think in terms of creativity, is being an artist a completely useless skill? Uh, and I think about being integrated to society is a big question that we probably kind of have to ask ourselves at some point of our lives. But I also think that, ah, oh, always something that you said. I think particularly artists, because that world of creativity is a world of frequent rejections or misunderstanding or right. choosing so all the time. World. It's hard world. And I think yeah. in terms of support, I mean, you know, you know, there's the Arts Council, there's so many big mm. cultural institutions, but I sometimes lose faith in f the fact that they know what it is to put out something that disrupts their norm, something that is like sharing a piece of something personal, because I think, you know, in, in, in the shape of your art piece yeah. or your intervention or whatever it is, and I think artists are such a vital part of this society, and... But it's, it's slightly cynical. As long as you know, you have to, one has to be able to commodify what they do or, or, or to convert it into cash to survive, or yeah. pick a different job uh, to make it worthwhile. So I, I feel like the society is just not fair to artists and to creativity. So this is a question of survival, which seems to go against creativity. But, it's an, in, but at the same time, we've heard from other people that creativity is as vital as breathing. So there's a yeah. yeah. No, exactly, because the creativity, I think it's also about how society okay. perceives it. Thank you, Amit, because really I will be just like yeah. bursting here. No, but I think this, as a society, if we don't start viewing creativity as necessity, as much as we're seeing yeah. earning money and making bread or something, then yeah. that's a problem. Then it, it will always be a competition. Like, yeah. am I, am I going to be creative or should I just do an admin job now yeah. because whatever? We have to value the arts and we have to show it with funding, with all sorts but of things. But is it the arts or is it something even more vital, which is this kind of spirit of creativity that Penny was talking about? Yeah, but that doesn't exist in a vacuum. Everybody needs to pay rent and stuff. We don't live in a unicorn land. Do you know what I mean? Okay. It's like, I'd love to actually, by the way. Okay, unicorn land. Maybe it's something that, um, yeah. that Rick can visualise. Um, we've got the latest visualisation from Rick, which is... I'm not even sure really what this is. It's like... Five finger thimble. Five, it's kind of like being controlled, I suppose, by, by the, by the powers that be. But you're kind of underwater as well. There, I'm not quite sure. Is there some kind of electrical hazard potentially with that image, Rick? What is going on with this image? I forgot. Okay, you've forgotten. Okay. So, um, 
I was, yeah. I was pleased recently to read that the Irish government is yeah. finally uh, supporting artists so they can get benefits and be an artist at the same time. Right. So and it's not frowned upon. So it's a special benefit program for yeah, artists? Yeah, they, they can get money to support themselves and then right. to be an artist for at least a year, I think. What do you think about this question of like the wider creativity? Is there this kind the of... The only like good things I've read about recently. <laughs> I don't know how it works in practice, but in theory it sounds pretty good. Yeah. Poets, I think they've always paid poets to, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's <coughs> very civilised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Poets don't pay tax, okay, in Ireland, okay, so that's maybe why all the poets... <laughs> Everyone's a poet now. <laughs> yeah. So nobody pays tax. Res tax. Yeah. Okay, right, Amit. No, no, sorry, I was just okay, yeah. poet for pirates, I didn't, I didn't oh, hear okay. that. Poets, yeah. Okay, so the pirate poet, um, Eve, yeah. <laughs> Just um, following on from what a few people have, have said around creativity and, and productivity, I think what's really interesting about creative processes is essentially the process, is mm. what goes into the making of things, all of the conversations and exchanges and how that can be the art in itself. So what I'm doing at the moment, looking at how to actually visualise what is going into some of the processes that I'm working on. Right. To show that actually there's a huge amount of labour involved in art making, yeah. making stuff. But it's and about this process, it's not yeah. necessarily about the product, it's about and the And the process. relationships, I yeah. wanted to go back to what um, Michaela yeah. was saying earlier around the relational the elements and yeah. relational change, because I see that as as the work, yeah. whatever we do, whatever the sort of creative outcome is, that's one sort of thing, and that can be measured, that can be looked at and observed, and you can decide whether you like it or not, but the actual mm. relational change, the yeah. being together, the being with people, is for me what that creative, yeah. you know, I mean, creativity is about. Been said about this idea of relationships and how relationship, building relationships, maintaining relationships, creating relationships, is a kind of almost unvalued part of our world. It just happens. Well, are they, are they, is it an actual art form? Is every relationship uh, a piece of yeah. art in itself? Yeah. Okay. That's is, it. Yeah. Is, making, is creating relationships an art form in itself? Are you were going to say something, Larissa? I think just, just on that, because a lot of the people that we see and that we work with have had damage done to them within relationships. Right, so a relationship's not necessarily positive, it could be negative as no, well. No, relationships that are abusive, and that yeah. could be relationships they have with services, for instance, or with benefits agencies, for instance. Yeah. Not just, if, I know you mentioned family earlier, but not just family, you know, difficult and challenging relationships that undermine you, that devalue you, that don't see you as a sort of productive member of society unless you are producing a thing. Yeah. So in order to actually do some of the, the work is is building relationships that people find meaningful and beneficial and supportive. Right. So and that's really what what the, the you know I the mean, work is that of something that's sort of Jackson valued Cafe enough this kind of positive relationship building. You're shaking your head, Nora, so Well I don't think it's valued by the, the powers that be, yeah. <laughs> to be honest. Um, but it's still hap but the but the great thing is that people do still build these relationships anyway, despite yeah. not having yeah. support. But then yeah. there are others who don't. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's let me, Michael. Let me just get a final thought from you, or just say it to Margot. She's down there by the bar, and then uh, we'll get. A, I want a final thought from you, though, as you go. But thanks for coming. Um, okay, so okay, so we're talking about relationships. The art of building. Beautiful relationships, I'm going to say. No one said beautiful, but I'm going to throw that one in. The chair, did, did you yeah, well, I, I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting idea, but is there also a place for um, creativity just as, as a personal thing? Uh, I mean, I've um, talked to a few people recently um, who've had mental health issues who are taking photographs, and they're actually just sort of going off on their own yeah. and taking photographs really into it and much better than they were, um, yeah. if you like, but it's actually very isolated. I mean, yeah. it's a kind of... It's just something they're doing by themselves, for yeah, themselves. So for, yeah, basically. And it's just like the circle is just one, really. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But it seems to have a value anyway, yeah. Mm. Did you have you got anything at this point, or just still picking up the pieces? Not sure. I just um, it yeah. sounds like a, maybe something about finding a voice or you know. Uh, yeah, do you, do you see yourself as a creative person? Um, yeah, 
Oh, I think we all are. I think I think everyone is. Yeah, I think we all are. Okay. Creative. All right, was there a point over here? Uh, yeah, well, you talk about shared media. If you have a culture, you're creating yeah. a culture, a shared a consensus, really. And I think if yeah. you've been really mentally ill, you, know, you, you feel cut off and you, people, no one understands you. So yeah. in a way, maybe you, you, if you're kind of finding people are understanding your art or that, you know, it's a way of communicating. And, and I think you, it is, it would probably help people if they felt other people were appreciating what they're saying, you know, which could help bond people. Okay, so there is this question of creating this consensus, this shared meaning, this shared understanding. Um, when, when you've got people with, that are making photographs by themselves, would that be the next step? Is it helpful? You think they're just quite happy doing... Well, actually, I mean, I, yeah. I said that and then I was thinking, but actually it's helped them make connections in another way because yeah. they've then met other people taking photos. Okay, so and, you know, it's, it's a stepping of, yeah. stone towards yeah, the kind yeah, of connection yeah, with other people. Yeah. But really, what he likes taking photographs are not people at all, of buildings and animals, but, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so there's this, there's, there's this question about creativity, about the, the act of creativity. Um, the vulnerability, the vulnerability of like an artist kind of showing something of themselves in their work, exposing something kind of personal or within them. And um, I suppose I'm thinking about that with mental health difficulties, people struggling with mental health, that they're yeah. vulnerable. They're, maybe they're exposing something about themselves that yeah. other people would keep, or they're not able to contain those things. I, so I don't, uh, I don't know if that's something about the vulnerability as well. As an artist, mm. you have to kind of allow yourself to be yeah. shot, shot down by others' opinions, right? You, okay, you've got so to be you're putting yourself out there. You're ex exposing yourself as an artist. And yeah. is that, how hard is that if you have got a vulnerability? Um, and how can we make that safe space where people can expose something about themselves which is actually quite personal? So maybe, it is about, maybe it is about that thing of it not really being safe to show yeah. that I don't I don't know even if you're if you're an artist and you and you yeah. create a piece of work and people people hate it I mean yeah. it, 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 is that part of the thing is that I mean, part of the thing to I can speak for myself yeah. because when I first started sitting in the middle of this table I found it very hard to do it now it's easy it's like driving a bus but you know back then in 1997 it was very very hard to do it but you need you to take that risk you're there in you the need middle. To, yeah, you, yeah you need to take that risk and how hard is that to do, to take that risk, to expose your creativity, to be open to each up, to other people's judgment, um, and just go ahead and do it anyway. Do you think that, I mean, I found that in some ways that's part of um, um, getting better or, or, or being happier with who you are, um, yeah. because you've actually kind of exposed a little bit of yourself yeah. in that way. I mean, can we create these platforms where it's easier to do that? To to be, to be creative, to, to not fear the judgment of others? Um, is it possible to, to make these spaces actually happen? Um, they are happening. Yeah. <laughs> they are happening. Yeah. They're out there, yeah. Give yeah. us an example. Well. <laughs> uh, the, apart from the Dragon Cafe. Actually, what um, yeah. I've come across recently mm. that I also would love to to mention here. So yeah. Daniel Reagan, who's a photographer that draws right. on his own lived experience yeah. um, and opens up spaces where people can yeah. learn photography, as you mentioned, you know, f for yourself, but also collectively. Um, so he runs a hub um, called the Arts and Health Hub, and it's an online community and a monthly space where people who do creative stuff based on lived experience can come and they can gather, they can share their work, they can ask people questions if they're struggling with an issue around their work. It's a very, very supportive space and you can upload your own events and activities to this online calendar. I think it's going to be running two um, self-care inspired um, conferences. Um, I think the first one's this summer and then there's probably another one next year. Again, for artists, for creatives, for people who use their lived experience to inform their work. So there are spaces out there. Yeah. It's just... Yeah, sort of finding out about them, becoming part of different communities, and also online, Twitter, Facebook yeah. communities. So there's lots of different ways of sharing, depending on what you're comfortable with, what you want to share. I kind of wonder, because you, you said about um, well, uh, well-being, no, what did you say? Uh, 
kind of well-being um, and self-care, I think. And I certainly have noticed that's the kind of phrase that's being thrown around. Or it, it, not thrown around, but like it, it's a buzzword. People talk about it, people make work, and they advocate on behalf of uh, self-care and stuff. But I'm, I'm just so sceptical about it because I think there's, you know, that in itself is just tied in with selling products. And I just wonder whether there's any... What kind is of there, products? Like candles uh, right. or retreats. Yeah. And for sure, we all need them and stuff costs money. But I, I think what certainly puts me off maybe going in and like following an Instagram influencer who's like really clear and articulate about their health is that that became like a brand that became like, like a different status of a celebrity. And I, like, I mm. think and a prob emphasis on celebrity as opposed to what they're talking about because I prefer people talk about you know positive view of mental health as opposed to I don't know lip implants I don't know something just came yeah. to my mind you know because I think it's a much more stronger message but I think you know the, the format of I need to make a celebrity and to build a career of it in order to be listened to in order to make money I just have a problem with that and I'm just like I just get skeptical and I just don't go to these events or I don't listen to these people even though I probably should because otherwise I'll just okay I so cope. I mean in the way there's this industry I mean, where, where, where do we want to go this you want to talk about social media and um, and it, the influencers come and get involved in this if you want to anyone no, they're not even listening but anyway because we haven't got it loud enough that's why um, <laughs> Do we want to talk about that? Do we want to talk about this kind of self-care industry and uh, how helpful, industry, yeah. how helpful that is? Eve? Yeah, I was just going to say I can I can totally understand your your reticence around going to events sort of branded as self-care events and strategies. Um, the arts and health hub I mentioned they're not selling anything and it's it's mm. a charitable project and it's really about the community and it's about mutual support for artists and that's what I sort of gravitate more towards anyway. I do feel uncomfortable about the sort of commodification of self-care and you mentioned industry. It very much seems like an industry. And also the way people are held responsible for their own care. Right. I fundamentally dislike that. I think care yeah. should be relational. Care should be about lots of people getting involved to support you. It's not your responsibility to look after your mental well-being and if you're not doing so, bad you. I find that really problematic. And how that relates to mental health in terms of recovery and the word recovery, which I find pl problematic in terms of that you have to recover from being yourself in some way. Right. And for many people, you know, they, they, they're, living with, they're living with how they are and they may have received various diagnoses and labels over the years. But like you were saying earlier, things can change and states can change and individuals can change. And um, I think recovery has become owned as right. well has become yeah. owned by many different movements originally it kind of started yeah. i think from the grassroots which was more about helping individuals you know connecting to feel better yeah. and then it became appropriated right. <laughs> and branded and right. you know having to go to recovery sessions or recovery places um which i know some people have found quite quite difficult and there's a movement called recovery in the bin Recovery, recovery in the bin, in the bin. Right. yeah, which I think is a really important yeah. movement where they 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 tackle a lot of these issues around yeah. what they view as being a kind of neoliberal liberal, the way it's been appropriated right. and taken away from grassroots movements. So. Come and have a seat on the table of chat if you want. You can bring your lunch. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah. I also don't like this word recovery, like mental health, working in mental health. And yeah. so I do recovery, and I mean, if you step back, take a wider perspective. I mean, yeah. life, life is a terminal condition. You don't, you, don't, you know, everyone dies. It's terminal. Yeah. You can't recover from that. So, yeah. you know, so. But I mean, looking at it the other way. I'm just saying. As, yeah. I don't know if I'm making any sense here, yeah. but you know, yeah. we are who we are. We live, we die. I mean, what are we trying to recover from? Okay. I don't know if it's yeah, yeah. So you don't like the word recovery either? Uh, um, not really. But I mean, I'm just yeah. want to just. Like stand on this. Like, let's take a bigger picture. We, you know, we're born, we live, we die. Um, can we draw something out of that? Um, it, can we have a different perspective? Um, yeah. I think the knowledge of like everything being like our lives being terminal 
it's just really like traumatic, like just to kind of when you realise that as however early you, you realise or however late, it's yeah. just like Jesus, you know. Yeah. So essentially, the entire life. Yeah, yeah. It's like the whole life is is, yeah. is a crisis. You know, the duration of your life is crisis. But maybe if we yeah. phrase it in a positive way. Yeah. Well, I mean, earlier on, ever over there, still on the computer. Um, we were talking about this kind of perpetual crisis that are in, in the terms of a political sense and the austerity being a perpetual crisis and being a way to manage people. But it, is it also the case on a personal level as well that we live in this state of perpetual crisis? Um, sort of on that, but going yeah. back to, to do, recovery yeah. and just yeah. thinking about the bigger theme of justice as well. Yeah. I think really what is problematic is the way recovery is operationalized and the way people what do you mean are by that? the the way people are expected to or encouraged to go through particular programs and that yeah. if you haven't recovered it's seen as a moral failing by some right. by some certain audiences not everyone but that the way that can be internalized by the person and become a source of shame another source of yeah. stigma that you know you've done the therapy you've done lots of different things you've done medication you've done a course and you're still not okay yeah going back to justice justice in society mm. is it not that we need to build better systems and support services to acknowledge that life is shit yeah. for a lot of people a lot of the time yeah so I'm really dubious about recovery and also the way the way peer support is often considered a sort of universal good in mental health. Yay, peer support. It's people who are struggling supporting others. Well, hang on a minute. Who's supporting them, actually? Okay. And a lot of peer support yeah. roles are poorly paid and have absolutely no support in place. And the way people are expected to use their lived experience to support other people. So it's actually very, very rare that you see yeah. these, these jobs and these roles that are well paid and really well supported. There's a few anomalies out there I've seen online adverts recently where yeah. I think oh actually that's that's well that's well paid and hopefully there will be some decent supervision but it is rare yeah. and it worries me that a lot of mental health care is actually being offset and, uh, and placed onto people who are already struggling you'll you'll support someone else in pain because you know pain well actually we're all very different and even if we've had a similar diagnosis for instance that doesn't mean our experiences are similar okay um, well, there's, I mean, there's so many things there. Where do we want to go? Do we want to go, and this is out to the rest of the table, do we want to talk about this idea of this sense of shame for not recovering, the, the difficulty of the language, the life is shit issue, peer support and supporting the supporters? What, where do you want to take this conversation? It's kind of up to you. My job is simply, as I said, just to move the microphone around and occasionally uh, refer to Rick's visualizations and try and make some sense out of this maybe it's because i'm always thinking about and especially recently um it's like some jobs get better recognition and some don't and what you just said you know not even paying properly um for jobs that require you know oh yeah of course you have to share your the piece of yourself and your lived experience of mental health in order to do this job properly uh here's hundred pounds day rate mm. it's like what you're doing uh you know th th there isn't enough value in that and i think as a society we need to rethink that how we value something that's so vital i don't know if mental health there's a there's a lot of buzz about it but do we actually on the policy level do we do enough to to value it well, to what integrate would you like to see being done what um I think like you were saying, you know, that all the roles, bless you, um, <laughs> all the roles that are kind of currently underpaid, where people are struggling, that's why they become peer supporters, because they have got lived experience, they need more support, and, and they're paid very little, which perpetuates this kind of like struggling and being in a constant crisis all the time. Uh, it just, it just yeah. deepens the crack, really. Okay. I, um, I mean, we're back to this idea of this constant continual crisis um, that we seem to be living through is it just a mode of is it just existential as you, as I mean you kind of implied or is it is it political 
Is it a bit of both? Um, There's a lot of research that shows that austerity is the leading cause of suicide in this country at the moment, and you can map it against austerity, but mm. it never gets reported on because obviously certain media bodies right. control the press. So it's, it's uh, I mean, there are researchers at King's, at, like Diana Rose and others, yeah. who have been talking about this for years, that the issues lie within the system and the, the way the politics, the impact that politics has had on health and communities and, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, Rick's just come up with a cheery visualisation there. I don't know, this is... Maybe it's a positive thing, but I mean, I guess what we're talking about is just... But, yeah, I mean, this is this perpetual sense of, of crisis. Um, we've got Michaela back at the table. What we're talking about at the moment is: do we live in this perpetual sense of crisis? Equal death. And is it down to austerity? Is it, or is it an existential thing that we just, no matter what what the political situation, we will we're going to be in this sense of crisis because of this these big things that we have to deal with in life. Um, so these are some of the things on there. There is something about productivity versus creativity uh, and all this stuff. It, is, it seems to be people are taking it in a quite cheery way, I have to say. Um, do you, do you have... That's because of your shirt, I oh, think. Oh, maybe I'm it's sure. the shirt, exactly. So maybe the shirt is the answer. Yeah. I recently did a mental health first aid course and some and people were saying at the beginning, so why are you here on this course? Why are you trying to, yeah, yeah, why are you here? And this one woman said, like, I work in, what did she say? She said, I work in some kind of like a play group type of thing. We do a lot of gardening and that kind of stuff. And the reason why I'm here is because I'm getting a lot of people uh, coming to me uh, in complete desp despair over climate change. And she right. said, I just feel like I cannot support them anymore by right. saying it's going to be okay because it's not going to be okay. So that's why I'm here. And that just blew my mind. Okay. Right. So climate change, I'll, I'll, I'll support on climate. Come to your second leave. Uh, no, yeah, I was thinking about climate change. I was thinking about, you know, most of us accept these days that unless we completely change everything we're doing, you know, we're, you know the climate, the, the environment's going to collapse, what, you know, all of these kind of things. And it's, it's not sustainable, and I'm kind of thinking, like, the way we live, the yeah. way society is, it's kind of, it's not sustainable for individuals' mental health. We're not yeah. supposed to be living like, you know, like that, in cities, like, that far apart from each other. Um, yeah. So it's inevitably, just like the way we consume and the way we produce is going to lead to our own extinction and, yeah. you know, all these kind of environmental disasters, apocalypse. It's also, yeah. it's also a mental health mental apocalypse. Health we can't, we can't live like this, yeah. So, so we're talking about sustainability. Change everything. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, just about on the uh, mental health, uh, the climate change. I've got a friend who's a psychotherapist around here and she yeah. um, went to a course a couple of weeks ago just on this issue because she's had so many clients who are having issues with climate change. Uh, yeah, yeah, anyway. So it is a thing. Is the, what, how does it kind of manifest <laughs> I Yeah, I, well, it's on worry and anxiety, I think. Right, okay, yeah. so it's the anxiety, yeah. the worry... So. I'm not oh, sure, I'm not sure yeah. how it manifests itself. So. Okay, the, the worry, the, the sort of extreme anxiety of a unsustainable world. Um, on that note, I've done quite a bit of work with Childline in the past, and I was talking to them um, about yeah. additions to their website yeah. for children about concerns around climate change. They've seen an increase in calls right. from quite young children who are really, really worried about the state of the planet yeah. and civilization and calling Childline. Yeah. And actually, when we look at all these mental health awareness weeks and days and whatever, and it's yeah. children's mental health awareness. I saw a recent campaign that was called, it was hashtag find your brave. And it was encouraging children to be really, really brave and resilient and yeah. you know, deal with their emotions. And we very rarely look at and talk about the systemic factors around children, things yeah. like climate change, things yeah. like austerity and poverty. Yeah. And it just seems to me a bit out of sync that you're kind of asking a child to do something that no adult can actually be expected to do, what to be brave asking? in the face of okay, mass destruction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I went to a talk by 
a leading climate change scientist, and he said it's a very easy solution to climate change if the top 1% get their act together yeah. and stop being such ridiculous consumers, and also they're the top 1% who are controlling the world. It will be fine. So okay. we need to focus um, on the top 1%. Yeah. That's what he said. It's simple. Okay, so no, 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 like, no more faffing around, making individuals worried well, about their behaviour. In the meantime, <laughs> these, these climate change specialists are making our children anxious, extremely anxious, and not just the children. Or the, or what's actually happening? Is it the reporting that's making them anxious, anxious or the, the events happening? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well... Don't shoot the messenger. Okay, so... Um, okay, so deal with the 1%, don't shoot the me messenger. Um, where are we going to go with this? We're talking about climate change right now and global anxiety, I suppose we can call it. And this, this 1% that are, in your mind, Nora and um, other people responsible for <laughs> climate change experts responsible for all of this. I was listening to another climate change expert who was just saying it's all about the kind of, you know, the fossil fuel industries and it's, and it's those guys that need to get their right together and actually make their industry safe and it's something that they could do, it would be expensive, but seeing as they represent 10% of, you know, global economy, they can probably afford it. Um, so I think kind of maybe there's something to say about this idea of just a, kind of an, an extractivist culture, yeah. you know, it's not just about kind of mineral resources, it's about human resources, it's about how we expend ourselves and how kind of how we kind of teach ourselves and our children to live, isn't it? It's this idea that we're kind of expendable resources, um, like fossil fuels. So I think okay. it's kind of a general Well I think the view about it certainly from a meet is that we are in the end expendable and we do expend <laughs> in the end um, but you know we, I guess we're talking about the anxiety that goes along with it and when we're going to expend and how we're going to expend that are the, the, some of the issues here and can we link this can we link this through this this global anxiety come to you in a second Lucia something that you said uh, Lucia was um, um, made me think and you were asking how uh, how this uh, you know the overwhelming sense of um, uh, the climate change and that kind of stuff. And how does that impact artists or people on like a daily basis, maybe? And like to me, sometimes it's just wh why you know just just n knowing that um, everything has got such a global reach. When you say something on your Twitter now, it can in no time just blow up and be all over the world. Yeah. Which is fresh. It's yeah, great, but also you, I get like three likes and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, no, but but, yeah. there, but there's that potential. Someone will say yeah. something that's trending or whatever, and suddenly it's everywhere. And I think that's quite overwhelming. Um, and I think if, as an artist, I sometimes feel like I need to make something meaningful, because who cares about, oh, I'm dual nationality. This is so interesting. No one gives a damn, really, because we're all gonna die, and there's climate change. Yeah. Like, wh why am I doing? Like, talking about n identity. Who cares about Brexit? Do you know what I mean? So it's there's like, big aspects. Yeah, the and I think that can be paralyzing. Like my friend yeah. said uh, to me, it's like, well, look, don't worry, don't worry about Brexit. No one's gonna be talking about that next year because we're all gonna die, and migration is only gonna be on an increase. So. Don't worry okay, about so, it. So, I mean, in a way, what I'm taking from that is how do we equip ourselves to deal with this, these global anxieties, climate change, we're all going to die, war, um, never mind Brexit. I mean, Brexit, we've not, you're the first person to mention Brexit, and we've two hours into this, we've done well. And that's, yeah. I think the whole death cafe movement is really good. Yeah. You heard the, about the, it. The what? Death. There's a death cafe. Yeah. There's a cafe movement where like you talk cafe, about death. But, but we're, death. Death. we're dead so people. The normalisation, yeah. well, just talk about it, talk yeah. about experiences of death. Okay. Yeah, it's a real thing if you look I it mean, up. I would, like to see, <laughs> I would like to see Rick's version of the death cafe because um, I think that you would, that's, that's going on to Rick's, into Rick's territory. Uh, a little bit. So, but there is a death cafe no, where I'm people being, are you not being a bit facetious. No, but there is a death yeah. cafe movement. But does it um, actually help people deal with these huge existential anxieties? I think originally have? the death cafe its movement was more around personal experiences yeah. of death and uh, grief and loss 
and um, could they yeah. expand it to, a, to maybe it has I haven't been to one recently it yeah. might have expanded I'm not sure what the topics are at the moment yeah. those personal experiences of death and grief and all those things are like pretty taboo people don't think yeah. about them maybe there's somewhere there is, a, is some kind of connection to struggles with mental health because yeah. we can't express the things that we need to express okay so actually we need to embrace the big things like death and not just need but yeah maybe need but yeah we, we we don't talk about we don't think about these things we don't acknowledge it we don't acknowledge we're gonna you know all these things and maybe that's kind of part of the difficulty okay is that part of the difficulty this this fact that we we can't deal with these big big subjects whether it's kind of like uh, I guess species-wide death or um, uh, our own, the death of our friends. I think we can deal with it, and that kind of comes in the form of uh, whatever All Saints Day, like the, you know the Mexican tradition, where you know it's it's a bit of fun, it's a bit of not exactly trivialising, but like taking something positive out of it and actually celebrating it. Because it's like my friend once said to me, because uh, like, we were having conversation about death and how everything is finite, and he was like, "Look, if there was no deadline, you'd never do anything." And I think that's and that really, you know, which makes me want to be even more productive. Active, yeah. cram as much as I can in my lifespan and make global impact. I mean, obviously being flippant, but I think it, it's a positive stimulus as well. The, okay, the, so death you know. can be a positive stimulus. Creativity. Sorry to jump in, but yeah, without death, we wouldn't have no need for any kind of creativity or innovation or, you know, anything. We would just live forever. Well, we wouldn't have to worry about keeping ourselves warm, sheltered, eating. I mean, if we were truly immortal and we couldn't die, we wouldn't have to do anything. We'd all just be living, you know. We so yeah. is death a, a major driver of creativity, innovation? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think when if you're looking at climate change as death as well, then I think it isn't because I think it's about powerlessness and that is a, sort of the opposite of creativity yeah. in a way. So I think... So it goes back to this thing yeah. about the 1% and they are the yeah. ones with the power to change... How well, well works. yeah, I mean, I think we probably can all do something, but it's very difficult because it's such a huge thing, isn't it? Okay, so yeah. I worked on a project about climate change, and we were trying to help people to connect with it using mm. food. Mm. And then the deeper I got into it, the more completely disenchanted and disillusioned I got because when I started to find out about the food system, I realised, oh, there's only about 20 corporations that control pretty much the entire right. global food system. So it's back to that power conversation. Of course, there are things you can do and you can grow your own yeah. food. But in terms of addressing the, the global issues, yeah. Come and take a seat on the table of chat. This is Tokyoki. You're very welcome. Um, Oh, Deidre, hang on, before you go, let me get a final thought from you. Uh, is there any, anything you've heard that you think has been an interesting point, or something that we can run with, that we can turn into a, a project, or something like that? Oh, I want to, I want to leave you with something, but I've got a big blank, big blank head. I mean, some of the things that people have been talking about, what about this global anxiety, is there anything you can do to address that? Um global anxiety is pro probably a good thing global anxiety so you you've got a lot nothing to, be to be concerned anxious. about the world on the planet yes yeah 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 i think so yeah okay. yeah is, i think so well that i mean that's an interesting point in itself is global anxiety actually a good thing come and see come and get come and get involved in this come and have a seat yeah two minutes two minutes we've got michaela we've got lucia we've got eve we've got nora we've got loretta uh we're gonna we're going we're going until two o'clock so um, so come and have a seat, bring your lunch, bring your coffees, bring me a coffee, um, and uh, yeah. Gareth is, Gareth is actually a researcher on the um, mental right. health injustice, he's the, he's the lead okay, researcher. Well, we can certainly feed back. And he's, and he's over there so with other researchers, so maybe they can join us in a little while. Maybe, maybe you could feed back on what we've got so far. Um, I mean, where do we want to take this conversation? Is it time to, to refresh and get like somebody new in the middle of the table um, for the very least so that I could rant a little bit on the outside rather than just be oh you can okay yeah, but I mean, let me just I get the Makina's point and then uh, <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking about going, go, obviously, you know, going back to the earlier discussion about kind of like personal responsibility and how that can sometimes be a salve on individual conscience, but it also kind of sometimes diffuses the desire and the capability to act politically. 
and I think very often sort of messages about climate change, you know, kind of about personal responsibilities for the food you eat and recycling. Yes, those are all good things, but actually the reality is um, it's very little in the face of kind of the, the big fossil, the, the, yeah, the big systemic, systemic, systemic things. Yeah. And also, I think you know it. It can be a salve. It can make you think you're doing something and get rid of the anxiety of, of, of yeah. powerlessness. Is and that it can not a good thing to just get to reduce the anxiety a little bit, or not if it stops you from acting politically. It would be my opinion. Okay. So it's in a way it's similar to what DG was saying that that anxiety is actually really useful because it, it allows us to act politically. Do you feel anxious about the environment? <laughs> I don't think so. No. Okay. Well, maybe. Um, um, do you want to have a go in the middle? I, um, okay, so we're going to just have a change of host, but we're going to keep the flow going, so don't go anywhere. Please do, please do, please do. Um, we're just about to have a change of host, or do you want to keep it going for five more minutes, just so I'm going to just explain. Come on, yes! Come and have a seat. Oh, we've got a, a whole load of new people. Um, so... Um, welcome to the table. This is Tokyoki Freeform Talk Show. We can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, it's kind of around the, the some of these issues of mental health and justice. We talked a lot about things like creative. I, I want to get a final thought from you, but I just need to. I, uh, well, we talked a lot about creativity. About um, is it society itself that is sick, um, and we put the onus onto the individual, where whether it comes to climate change. Or, um, or our own uh, mental state of mental well-being, um, and when we talk less about relationships and how those relationships work, and that's been sort of some of the some of the key sort of um, outputs of the discussion. We've got a whole load of new people here at the table. We've got a, a fresh wave. So um, let's just get some names. I'm going to go around the table and get everyone's name, and then I think you're leaving. So yeah. I want to get a final thought from you. But let me just get everyone's name. So we've got I'm Gareth and Michaela, Lucia, Eve, Nora, um, Andrew, Kevin, Lucy, Margot, and Judy. With Judy. final thought? Yeah. Um, I'm a bit against ca catastrophizing so much, and I think human, like we talk about creativity, human ingenuity, I think there's, we need to highlight things that really are being done, positive things. I mean, there's just one little thing I saw in, on the internet, and it was, a, it was something, you know, there's so much about refugees and in their camps, Syria, all these awful pe you know, people struggling in their, uh, in, in, without any, any, any livelihood or anything. And there was an amazing story, I think it was in Lebanon, where they, in a refugee camp, they were using hydroponics. Right. And I don't know if anyone heard about that, but it was, I think it was Sheffield University, they'd set up the scheme, which was built on old mattresses that had been stored in a cupboard somewhere and they had created these gardens for these refugees, Syrian refugees who yeah. were growing their own gardens in a refugee yeah. camp. So you know there are some amazing ways to get around these terrible yeah. situations which um, yeah. and I think we need to highlight those amazing things that are, that are already being done you know against right, okay, this so terrible force of delu you know yeah. I mean, deluge. Just to feel people, there's a lot yeah. of new people at the table, we were talking about this global anxiety, this anxiety about climate change and all the kids are getting very upset about it and there's a general you know anxiety when it comes to climate change that's out there but should we be looking on the more on the positive side of of the the human ingenuity and some of the solutions to some of these problems um, is it time for a change of host because I I've had to I'm gonna jump out the middle of the table stay there everybody we get Margot's gonna jump in you're gonna just sit on this bit over here and just spin I'm gonna you're gonna go under you don't fancy it okay so keep it warm let's give Margot a round of applause just a and uh, just, just to save, to save of spillage over there, uh, uh, and give Mikey a little round of applause, just a little one. But he's done really well for the past two hours, and we've got a new person around the table. Can I get your name? I'm Margot, by the way. What's your name? Pretty, pretty. Uh, let let me see, let me see if I can get the names. Are you guys going? That's fine. Let me just get a round of names, and then I'll get your final thoughts. How about that? Is that okay? That's a really dashing jumpsuit as well. I just got to mention. So we've got. Um, Pretty, we've got Michaela, we've got Gareth, we've got Xavier. Oh, is your name still Xavier? 
<laughs> yes. Okay, if you get away with it. We've got Mikey, we've got Lucy, we've got Kevin, we've got... What's her name? Uh, Andrew. Andrew, Andrew uh, and we've got Nora and Eve. So, uh, you girls are going. So, what would be your final thoughts? Because we talked about a lot of things here. Is there anything they're going to leave us with? Maybe a question to the table. Um, I think Michaela just touched upon it there around activism. Um, I think activism is really key in relation to all these injustices that we've talked about. And what do we need? To, and, and how do we go about empowering people to feel like they can act? and be activists. So yeah, getting activism back. I mean, it is, it's there. Um, and I think the comment by the other person who just left, there was a book I read called Hope in the Dark, which was by Rebecca Solnit, and it's about all these different examples of activism. Um, it was re in relation to environment. And I found it really helpful, because actually it kind of thought, OK, those people managed to achieve that. You know, if you think about Silent Spring, you know, a lot of these, these topics. So. I think that's it's really important. How, what, what are the stories and what are the communities we need to build to enable more activism to take place? Because mm -hmm. we do have some power. Some people don't, but actually I'd say most of us around this table and in this building um, and in this university have got quite a lot of power, actually, mm -hmm. when you compare our situation to refugees who are living in camps or people who haven't had any education. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah, what can we do with that? So it's about kind of, um, yeah, building the activism and really kind of taking advantage of our position where we are in position of power, actually. You may not always feel like it, but uh, I'll come to you, Michaela, just in one second, because uh, you were nodding as well as you were talking about uh, activism. Yes. Um, oh, yeah, so I... Oh, yes, thank you. Oh, oh dear. Connect. This feels very formal. Um, That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been reading quite a bit about... Um, activism at the moment and a piece that someone sent me it's not um, it's not published yet so I can't say too much about it but it was a piece about um, self-harm activism and I found it really interesting because I have a history of self-harm and I wouldn't necessarily say like my body is a political statement um, but it was a piece about being out, about self-harm in academia, and about how difficult it is to be out about self-harm in other settings, and other settings where it's viewed in a certain way, and there's lots of narratives about that, and some of them are quite problematic. So I was thinking a lot about ways of sharing stories and experiences, even if you don't identify as an activist, per se. And there was a link in this piece um, to a study about everyday activism, and this is about the small acts that any person can do to offer up different perspectives and to offer something into a conversation or an exchange that just creates a little bit of a space to think differently. So I've been trying to think about this in my own life, right? So I don't, I wouldn't call myself an activist with a capital A, but what can I do every single day in every relationship and every conversation that can create space and platforms for stories that are difficult to hear, stories that don't have much space and, and air time, and create space for other people to do so through my work, whether it's through audio, whether it's through film, whether it's through other forms of visual art, because I'm totally aware of like who's here today, but also who isn't here. We don't have anybody here who's under a section. We don't have anybody here who's in prison. Um, so just creating opportunities where we can so have we space anyway, for people. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. But yes, thank you very much all. Yeah. And thank you very much. Thanks, yeah. Yeah. Well, you've been really great and you've been here for a while contributing really great things into the conversation. So thank you for sharing your final thoughts. I can come back to you, Michaela, if you remember what you were going to say or maybe your train of thoughts. Yes? I was just thinking about this idea of capacity, which I know is a kind of a common theme amongst kind of researchers, and um, I was kind of thinking about how, as academics, we tend to kind of have this kind of emphasis on critical thinking, which can actually kind of uh, shift our focus to um, incapacity or lack of capacity, and that's kind of sometimes privileged in academic language and kind of academic thinking to think of kind of the negative but I, you know just you talking Eve about kind of that shift in thinking that 
maybe allows us to think of different capacities, the pl plural capacities, you know, what are the capacities that we're not recognizing within those kind of existing models? Thank you, Taylor. I think one of the things about creativity in art is that you can come up with, you can have half an idea that can be completed by the viewer of the art or the another participant in an art project and you don't have to have it completely formed out like you do in the academic world so you can sort of feel your way through ideas and that's certainly something we do with, with Tokioki is that we kind of bit, put bits of ideas together from different people um, to create something new and it, it is, is an artistic way of solving a problem that I think is really, really useful and, and certainly some of the problems we're talking about here we don't have to have the whole idea from one person, I think you have to sometimes in, academ in academia it has to all be like a complete thesis I mean, it kind of makes me think of a question because I think, I'm guessing, I could be completely wrong, but I think we've got a lot of academics around the table here. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, but do you think that academia doesn't, you know, does academia give you an opportunity to be creative in, in any way if you were to have your act of, you know, moment of activism and maybe introducing creativity into your practice uh, as academics? Is that even possible? Is, that, or is it a completely different world? Any old academic can answer that. Um, anyone? Gareth, I feel like you've got something there you want to say. Uh, well, we were just having lunch and talking about um, the creativity of getting studies through uh, research ethics committees. <laughs> and uh, so I think we were feeling profoundly uncreative. <laughs> And Somebody here was earlier talking about making, what was it, talking about and food and um, using yeah. it as a, opening up dialogue to talk about climate change and it got very bleak very quickly. Anyway, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, now this is a, an area of research where I think you can feel a victim actually uh, quite, quite, um, quite easily. But it does also, um, yeah, I mean it's an area of uh, where we actually try and spend quite a lot of time convincing ethics committees and universities which oversee studies and so on that in fact um, you know participating in research and so forth is generally a good thing and uh, you know people generally speaking like to do it you know it kind of affords opportunities and can be interesting in itself in a way almost um, not exactly therapeutic but but um, a positive experience in the main, you know, it feels like you, you're, you're contributing and, and um, being taken seriously and recognised. But it can actually often feel as if you're, you're really pushing against closed doors on that. Um, and it can feel, as a researcher, it can feel quite negative. Can you give us an example of when you felt mm. like you were pushing against a closed door? And if you guys yeah, have... well, so the closest to this is uh, are the um, researchers around the table. So we should, Lucy, do you want to speak? speak to this. How you can get a positive frame on uh, research participation uh, uh, in the context of people who are very worried about vulnerable people, you know, being kind of exploited, I suppose, or, or harmed by, um, by research. Yeah. I feel like you should be in the middle, Gareth. I think you've got, you know, you are very good at opening questions to the table, but I think you know it's a very important um, point that you made there um, about you know how do you kind of overcome you know maybe your fear of not wanting to exploit the vulnerable people. How do you make the best out of the research and actually the research that brings some results? Um, I'll do you want to jump in, Mikey? Um, Lucy, do you want to say? So um, I'm involved in a research project working with people who have fluctuating capacities. These are people who most of the time um, absolutely have capacity to make decisions about participating in research, participating in their treatment. Um, but it took a lot of thought um, to put together an application to do an interview study um, with, this, with, these, with this group of people because there are times when um, you know, that, that ability to make decisions is, is interrupted and I think um, ethics committees can feel very nervous that they, these, these are people who might be very vulnerable, um, who you know, might um, 
you might be taken advantage of in, in some way. Um, and actually, um, now I've um, the, the application has been approved and we're, we're working on the interview study, um, it's been an enormous privilege um, to start um, talking with people who, um, you know, as part of the research of being given a voice, um, you know, that what they are saying is it's a qualitative study, so their words, um, you know, will, will be used um, as part of the data set, their voice will be heard, their voice will be published. Um, and so I think it can be really empowering for people and a really, you know, valuable opportunity for, for a group who might be, you know, dismissed as having not having had the capacity to, to, to participate in research projects. That, that can be it, it, it's so important to, to communicate that to, um, to, to these committees. Mm. Thank you. Sorry, I thought you had... Yeah. I just think just the, the question that, like, the, this idea of capacity is, is being used, I think it's a, it's a kind of technical term that maybe not everyone around the table knows about. It's this idea of being able to make your own decisions. As far as I know, I'm not an expert, I just read the website. So um, I just wanted to say that to, to people that maybe, on well, Monday, it's mostly academics around the table now. But um, I think, you know, from going back to this kind of like artistic perspective, the, one of the things we do a lot in our work is have this kind of, this tension between the fantastical and the realistic. And that's actually, a, and I see this as well in the ethics committee in a way it's a creative role as well because they are trying to just say or well, hopefully not like this but like this or kind of provide other solutions or, or be that that tension of realism against the kind of fantastical and we, we we've got an event called who wants to be where we ask the crowd to create something together and then the, the host just says yes 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 to everything and then we've got another role which is the voice of reason that actually is the voice of, re of reality that says no how can we do this in reality so I, th I think in a way it's a similar tension between the researcher and the ethics committee mm -hmm. I'm just interested in what you said the voice of reality is the voice of reason so I'm thinking about that in terms of mental health and arts because you know reality and art are kind of two slightly different things and so when you say the voice of reason is the voice of reality it just made me think that's the kind of thing we're constrained within aren't we like we always have to listen to the voice of reality or and that 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 does something impacts art the appraisal process i was just thinking about kind of the, the advanced directives which is obviously your research stream which is this kind of idea that people make decisions about a point in time when they might think that they don't have capacity to make decisions and how they plan for those particular moments and how the most interesting picture of that condition is you know Odysseus being kind of strapped to the mast and he kind of you know it's, it's called the Odysseus paradox isn't it this kind of idea that um, Odysseus tells his sailors you know when when the sirens call you know don't believe what I'm saying don't trust my voice at that point I'll, I'll, I'll be asking you to set me free but I think what's interesting is that that picture is created through art through literature um, and how kind of compelling and interesting that image is that artistry in the production of that image and um, we've been working with um, an artist at the Bethlehem Gallery on this particular strand and I've known her for many years and um, we were discussing her research um, with a group of students and it was the first time that she disclosed that she you know, had experience of kind of like bipolar, and I've known her for five or six years. And so I was just thinking about how interesting it is that kind of the art space can somehow um, allow people to disclose on their own terms and in a very particular way. And I think, you know, just thinking about the kind of advantages of kind of the Bethlehem Gallery artist working with the research streams, you know, it's, it's not just about voice, it's about. Um, I don't know. It's about kind of a certain types of disclosure, and it's about a certain kind of handing the narrative back to the individual and giving them the opportunity to construct that narrative in a particular way, sometimes in opposition to more kind of clinical models, perhaps, potentially. I don't know. So it's kind of like creating the reality where you know, where you can kind of draw parallels between the, the reality, the voice of reason, whatever. Um, 
in a kind of safe environment of a cr creative imagery is kind of safe to disclose in those spaces. Um, maybe something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. Maybe because it kind of distances the individual from the experience. Maybe through telling the story, the kind of classical story of Odysseus, that somehow you can sort of say, this is a kind of, this is not just my own lived experience. It's it's something to do with the universe, you know, kind of universal condition. So in some ways, maybe it's kind of creates a safe space that you can kind of put it into story, put it into narrative, put it into art, and that you can kind of both own it, but also kind of distance yourself from it at the same time. And it's a point of contact between you and the research and you and other people. So it's a safe kind of middle mediating object, almost a kind of middle story that's owned by everybody. Mm -hmm. So this kind of like, a, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's just, it's very interesting that you're saying about, you know, creative, uh, creating that kind of other reality where people can find maybe their experiences being represented. And is that a common thing done in academia? I'm kind of like looking out to people. I mean, is that creativity is kind of using that kind of imagery? Is that a common thing to illustrate some points or, you know, to create a safe environment um, where people can share their views and opinions? Yeah? Um, I think that's a really interesting question and a, and a really a really important thing for us to think about because I'm not sure it always has been the way that we've expressed and explored ideas but I think it's becoming more so now and, and I think um, in the Mental Health and Justice Project art has interfaced with our work in quite a lot of different ways actually and, and in different places um, I think key to our particular project, the Mental Health and Justice Project, has been um, a group of service users that have been really involved, really at every level. Our service user advisory group, who who we've um, en enlisted from a completely different, separate organisation and a completely separate and independent, and they've helped us to think about some of these things. Um, in, my, in my own particular work, one thing I've been uh, involved with is developing uh, a sort of psychological measure which which is much more attractive and, and friendly and engaging for the person to use and um, so we um, we were working with a technology firm uh, and a graphic designer developing you know visual art images if you like at that level and and trying to work in stories and and images as well that 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 maybe seem more interesting and more relevant for a person who might be asked to take part in a research project that might otherwise be really quite boring. Um, and so that's been interesting. And we, we were thinking of it as gamifying um, our research instruments at first, but we've had to be a bit careful how we thought about that because actually, of course, we're not producing a game at all, are we? We're still asking someone to come and help help us with our research. So we've had to think again about even the way the way we frame that. And these have been really important questions. I think you're right. And um, you were saying, Mikey, earlier about creativity and being an artist as a way where you can contribute a half idea and then kind of work it out as you go along. Yeah, I mean, I just want to come up to this point about gamifying because like, the other week we were we were in the in Stratford trying to deal with the problem of knife crime um, and youth violence and we wanted to gamify this with the people of Newham the parents that had lost children to knife crime. It was a very very serious issue but why did we want to gamify it because we wanted to have a creative response to this problem because you know, people have said the same things again and again and again for 20, 30 years. But it's a question of how to actually gamify that in a way that's respectful to some very serious issues. And I think it's just about, going back to this question of reality, it's just about just shifting the reality and having a different perspective on it. Um, and having a more creative perspective on it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think as well it's about kind of exploring kind of plural identities as well, isn't it? I think kind of that's kind of quite interesting because very often um, in there are lots of kind of rehearsed stories about what it means to be an artist and very often people resort to this idea of self-expression. But really kind of in contemporary art practice it's about multiple selves. It's about the potential for actually kind of like waking up one day and thinking this is the, this is the self that I'm going to somehow put out there in the world. It's going to serve a particular purpose. It's like what, what is this version of myself good for? So it's that kind of creativity and kind of like developing kind of 
um, strategic kind of identities <laughs> that allows you to kind of operate in the world. And I think that's many of the artists who've been working kind of with the researchers are, ex are kind of exploring this idea of kind of how can this kind of art creativity, um, this artistic identity, which is one of many potential identities, operate within this particular field in a, in a productive and generative way? Um, um, you wanted to yeah, say... Like um, <laughs> Duchamp Rose de la Vie, you know, he just invented an alter ego to produce art. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of that, continuing that, I tried to, well, I did various guises of me dressed as different people, women as well. And I asked at the market, sort of what, one of the ladies works on the stalls, how to address as a woman. And she said, what, what do you want to present? Which is something I never really thought of you know, what you present to the world, and um, yeah, I can't say anything deep after that, sorry. No, but I think that's deep enough, that's very, very interesting. Well, no, I'm just now thinking about what about the identity of the researcher? Would you ever change your identity in order to get a different perspective on research? Yeah. Arguably, we're always, our identity is always developing until we die. Yeah. I mean, the research, um, it's like the observer effect. As soon as you've got somebody observing, researching, you're, you're changing the outcome. Mm -hmm. So how do you ever get to something truer? Like, the research distorts um, to some degree. I, I, I'm not a researcher, but... Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think, I think that, that's... I completely agree with that, yeah. And I think it's really rare to read a research paper where the researchers state something about actually who they are at the start of it. So you can understand, um, yeah, not, not just someone's profession but uh, and, and their names, exactly, but more than that, you know, and actually all different bits of context would affect how you would read that bit of research because obviously that, that's, that's the perspective they've come from. Yes, to see the, see the researcher's lens that they're kind of seeing through. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting what you said about people having the same conversations you were saying about the context of knife crime over and over again and, I, and we're talking about kind of changing identities. Is, is it maybe the case, is it, I mean, is it the case that when you change your identity maybe from researcher to the actual person that you are outside of it, maybe you are more capable of arriving at different conclusions or different strands of thoughts. Um, if yeah, can you unlearn something which you can't really? Can you? Can't you? And you've got anybody's got views on that? Depends on what you've learned. Mm -hmm. You know, if you learn something horrific, you can't unlearn it, mm -hmm. or something world-changing, something like that. Yeah. Quick, over to them. Quick. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a research paper that was done here some years ago, uh, which looked at all the um, uh, all of the junior doctors that were coming into, you know, the Institute of Psychiatry. Uh, before you go, before you go, okay. So, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. Let's park you there. Um, would you give us a final thought? Anything that's been said on the table, maybe that made you think? We'll come back to you. So hold that thought. Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking about the concept of identity and. Um, whether or not you'd be able to remove the researcher from you um, in engaging with people. I think it, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I don't think there's a straightforward answer. Um, what identity would you choose if you weren't a researcher, assuming you are a researcher? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of perspective could you bring to your research? But you start, start saying what kind of identity people are not just researchers. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. Whoever, like you're a researcher, but you bring a whole bunch of. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pretty. Bye Thank now. you so much. We've got some new people around the table. Can I just very quickly grab, well, new previous people, uh, returning people? Uh, it's Lucia, isn't it? Shall, shall we just quickly do a round of names? We've got Lucia, Xavier, Andrew, uh, Kevin, Lucy. What's your name? Loretta. It is Loretta, right? Amit. Amit, Gareth, and Michaela, and Mikey, and I'm Margot. So we've just been talking about all these things, about changing identity as a, as a researcher, maybe as a way of gaining new perspective, and also the world of creativity and the art as maybe like a free-roaming realm where we can reinvent or retell our stories in a different way. Um, yes, Xavier? 
I think the, the, it's not a world of creativity. We will be creative, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's how we direct it, what the demands we put on it are, and where we exercise it, mm -hmm. sort of thing. And then I cut off a Gareth who, uh, it's a test of memory. Do you remember what you were talking about, Gareth? Yeah, just yeah. trying to recall it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so there was this study that was done, kind of in a way bringing the research lens onto the very thing we're talking about, basically. And it was um, looking at people who are coming into a, essentially a research institution mm -hmm. and, um, and then seeing um, basically whether they were spending a lot of their time reflecting in the, and the, so the measure they made of that of whether, is whether or not they, they got into psychoanalysis, so whether they, they engaged in psychotherapeutic practices mm -hmm. themselves, either had it themselves or are active. So a measure of being reflective, you know, thinking about who am I and so on. And then they um, related this to how productive you were in terms of research papers. <laughs> and basically, the more interested in, uh, or active in psychotherapy you were, the less productive you were in <laughs> producing research. So the kind of, the word went out that if you want to have a research career, don't do psychoanalysis, you know. Oh, wow. That's but, a, <laughs> section gets in the way. Of, um, gets in the way, yeah. We, but I think, I think things have, have, uh, have sort of moved on since then. Since now, then. we had somebody here from uh, uh, Reinventing psy um, Psychiatry. Oh, no, maybe that's something different then. Anyway, Mikey? No, I mean, in the art world, we just say, don't think it, do it. And maybe it's the same with the research as well. Don't think about it too much. Just do it. Well, you've got to think about it. I was just thinking about that, that whole idea of kind of identities and stories and things like that and kind of in, in philosophical terms um, and this idea of kind of the, the whole shift from Descartes, I think therefore I am, to Heidegger, thinking happens, to Foucault, that the thought thinks me. You know, that somehow the stories are all kind of out there and that we're just these kind of mouthpieces for the, the kind of the potential kind of identities. And sometimes I think that's quite terrifying and liberating at the same time. Um, but kind of, I'm just thinking of the way that artists can kind of amplify the range of kind of voices that are being spoken, that are being kind of ventriloquized, I suppose. <laughs> and I think creativity, well, yeah, artistry artists they have kind of maybe a, a quicker access to you know that kind of vocabulary or that kind of way um, of seeing things um, but we can take this conversation in whatever direction you want we can carry on talking about these things if there's anything that kind of sparked off your thoughts and maybe you weren't um, you know you didn't pounce on a chance of having a microphone yes Kevin yeah so I suppose my question as a researcher is how can we use art and creativity to communicate our research to um, wider communities. So I do a lot of work with um, marginalised communities, mainly BME and older adults, and I'm quite conscious that I want my research to reach those sorts of communities, and that might not be as readily um, easy to do as, say, for the traditional communities. Talking earlier at the beginning about maybe cultural um, perceptions of what mental health is and things which are culturally accepted or not, and you're talking about tapping into specific communities to then represent them and reflect them in um, research. So, um, yeah, do we have? Any? Well, I mean, I think the answer lies with those communities, but engaging them in some kind of creative process that might make sense to them, whatever that is. Um, I can't necessarily speak for BME, but may can speak for older community these days. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think the answer is, I personally, and earlier on we were saying creativity isn't an add-on thing. It's something that people, it's like breathing. It's a, something that people do. So it's just about, I think, just unleashing that. I sort of feel from listening to what people say that the academics' creativity is somehow stymied by things like ethics committee telling them what to do or expectations of what an academic does and I think that is to me since like the main issue rather than how to get in touch I think that's just like it's just about doing it and seeing what works and what doesn't work. Is there much flexibility in in the world to do what we want to do in the way we want to do it and just hope for some kind of outcome but maybe 
But it's the, the arts, you know, is uh, it's expressive. It's about self-realization and so forth. And uh, so, I, and I guess the question then is, is, is whether it really ends up becoming, in a way that's problematic from a, um, a research perspective, it starts becoming about me, really. Go on. I say all this arts is expressive, but it is a discipline. You know, most arts are a kind of discipline, a form of discipline. Um, there was a word I was going to say, autoethnography. Have a, I can't remember quite what it means, but it might be suitable. Have a look. It's kind of like the journey and the personality in the work. So, yeah, further reading for you. I'm afraid I can't supply any more info than that. Thank you for providing this uh, link there. Um, I was just thinking something that could work for you, which is, uh, I'm a filmmaker, but it's just to, to do some kind of participatory filmmaking around your group and getting them to decide on the, how they want to visualise stuff, but also talk stuff through and, and actually then end up with something that you can use. Um, yeah. Somebody was saying earlier, and I think it was you, Michaela, ages ago now it seems, um, about using people themselves as a creative material, the fabric of which the art... Yeah, I used to um, <laughs> run the seniors group at kind of Tate Modern in Southwark, and it was a very strong kind of older female BME kind of like group who lived kind of locally. And I remember they were, it's such an interesting group to work with because with all the other kind of so-called community groups that I would work with, I would take them into kind of the conceptual area of the gallery and everybody would just like look at me with daggers. <laughs> it's like, why have you brought us in front of this? metal cube um, but, but the older women from the BME community were completely fantastic the more kind of metaphysical the work became the more kind of um, the conversation <laughs> kind of buzzed and I, I remember tr trying to think about why they had the language to talk about kind of art and they felt so at ease with this kind of quite challenging work and and, and one woman explained to me that it, she was used to kind of speaking about certain abstract kind of concepts in her kind of in her church um, and it, that, that came down directly from her and I thought that was kind of really interesting that she was kind of co-opting a language that she used in another area of her life and using it creatively in another context. So I'm just thinking about this whole idea of kind of situated knowledge, so knowledge that kind of the capacity to kind of talk and describe and engage that comes from one particular environment that actually gives you the skills and the capacity to kind of transfer to another kind of space. And it's just actually just trying to kind of enable people to recognize that they have those skills in any case. They might have practiced them elsewhere, but it's just a matter of really relocating them into another space where they, where they traditionally might feel excluded from. I mean, we all have our jargon, don't we? And we all kind of put our fences up. And, and I think it's, it's about acknowledging that, you know, it's finding that kind of common ground, which is often kind of conceptual and linguistic. But those skills, they, they help people have those skills. They're just developed in other spaces that we perhaps are not capable of recognizing. It's funny how it took you to kind of like interpret what was actually going on for you know people oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yeah exactly i was really curious i was really curious because it was such a distinctive kind of um, quality of this particular group that they were just not phased by the most conceptual abstract work and i was just thinking right. what how? Why is that? Why is everybody just sitting here, kind of smiling and nodding, and waiting their time to kind of, you know, offer their, an interpretation? And you kind of worked it out in a conversation. I'm going to come to you. I was just going to tack on to that. I was wondering if what you were going to say was that these people uh, were used to having repeatedly to explain to people things that they didn't understand. So things about their own life that the wider community didn't understand, so they were used to constantly having to find ways to explain things, um, you know, that, 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 were, that didn't exist for other people almost. And that, you know, and there are parallels with maybe how a person with mental illness might, might explain concepts as well, that maybe they have a whole language and vocabulary that other people don't have because they're used to dealing in those concepts that inherently, you know, link in well with art and creativity. I like that. I like that. You know, the. Yeah. 
I think what was interesting was about kind of how this group could, could make a choice whether they wanted to participate or not, and they did that quite strategically and quite clearly. So sometimes they would opt out of a conversation, quite very politely, very, you know, obeying the kind of the rules of the game, and then at another point they would opt in. So it was, they were very conscious also that they were kind of exchanging knowledge. So there was kind of a, a kind of they were. You know, it was very much about the equality of the exchange. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I didn't kind of... It's something I've often thought about, and I don't know whether... It, I think it, it might come from this having to kind of explain or justify a position. But it was also about the way they controlled their knowledge and respected their own knowledge as a kind of a group in the sense that they would kind of almost kind of like offer it as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, not as a bartering tool, but as a kind of, as a, as, as a point of exchange. They were very conscious that they were giving something, that it wasn't just about me as a kind of gallery representative explaining the work. Mm -hmm. They were very kind of aware that they had something to, yeah. Excellent. Mikey? Well, this is a few points back, because I was just wanted to go to Gareth's point about the art being about self-expression. For, for me, as an artist, art is about allowing other people to express themselves and actually facilitating expression and doing that in a creative way. Uh, which come, brings us to, we're kind of going to have to wrap this up soon, So, but, but before we do, and I think it's everyone has got the right, if not the duty, to have a final thought um, on this. But let, I just want to go through some of the images that Rick's doing. So Rick, can we start off at the beginning um, and just go through the images that we've had today? Terrifying place. Are you ready for that, Rick? Yeah, okay, so um, this is what we started off with. I think this was your point, Xavier, at the beginning. Without justice, there can be no peace. This is where we sort of kicked off with. Yeah, at the very beginning. Um, and this was this idea that how important justice was and, that, and how important not that whole, you know, having that whole framework and developing that framework was... Mental health as well. Yeah. It's kind of mental health. If you feel you're, you've been done wrong by mentally, you feel that justice hasn't been done. Yeah. You know, whether it be in the scales of justice yeah. or your unsettled mind. Yeah, so if you live, if you've been living in an unjust situation, then you can't have peep, inner peace either. Which brings us on to the next one, which is like um, about the, the mind itself can be an incarcerating space. Um, and we talked about how that can, we can be limited by our own mind or, or stuck or. Um, and then we sort of start, actually moved on to this idea that it was actually society that defined a lot of these uh, barriers. Um, let's maybe move on to the next one. This is, a, um, this is about this idea, and it goes back to this idea of relational art and connecting people. Could you have a kind of... This was very controversial because not pe people didn't see this as, a, as the police being the right people to do it, but this kind of like this kind of creative police, the police that were connecting people, or if not the police, some other service that kind of came and connected people and fostered creativity as a kind of institutional service. Or should it be institutional? These are some of the questions we were talking about that this image refers to. Let's move on to the next one. This is about sometimes calling things art actually um, kind of limits people and it could make it seem elitist. Well, what we're really talking about is this kind of creative self and should we actually be talking about art? And then there's also this idea of the trap of language. However you tell the story, you're stuck within the language and sometimes that language becomes inappropriate or it doesn't quite capture what we're talking about. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Um, this one, we can't remember what this is. It's about something like being controlled by our, by the you know, our, in a way, it's maybe this thing you were talking about, this lens of, like, the, wor the world, the institution, the state, kind of almost controlling how we see things. But I don't know why. I'm not, Rick, any more on this one? Can you remember? Uh, who is the author? What's that? I wrote, who is the author? Who's the author? Okay, so this is also about who... Who actually creates the work? Is it the world? Is it the society? Um, who tells the story exactly? So, okay, let's move on. This is about um, the trouble. Yeah, who controls the narrative? Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
And this is about, um, we were talking about Van Gogh and his troubles. Would he rather live a happy life and not have the impact as an artist? Um, and about, um, in a way, the trouble and the mental health difficulties that a lot of key figures have had in their art. And then there's also, quite a thing that you mentioned, Lucia, this idea that you don't have to be a financially or fame-wise successful artist for art to be successful in terms of your own world and your own life. That art can be very important for you personally. Move uh, on to the next one. I think that's pretty straightforward. Just the message. It's, it's about this kind of existential angst and this existential anxiety. And how do we, is that, can that be turning into a positive thing? This question of like, you know, the facts of life, the reality of, of life and death. How do we deal with that kind of emotionally and from, uh, also from a mental health perspective and from an emotional perspective? Uh, this is about the impact of, uh, in a way, the other side of that. It's like some of this is political and some of this is um, about this constant state of um, crisis that we seem to be living in um, that has got some people around the table saying it's got a political motivation to keep everybody in a state of crisis and that's very detrimental to the individual, um, even though it might be beneficial for the economy, etc., etc. Um, this is about this kind of global anxiety about climate change and our planet and that's actually translating onto the kids are getting very upset about, young people are very upset about the world and how does that affect their mental health and their emotional state. And apparently the answer to the, uh, to the climate crisis is very simple, just uh, focus on the 1% <laughs> who can make the <laughs> difference, it's very clear and very doable. So one person said that, just focus on the 1% and then we can deal with this problem, it's the 1% issue. Um, let's move on. This is the idea of the death cafe, as Rick's visualised, it's very popular. <laughs> um, but death's kind of like not even in the queue there, so maybe that's the way to cheat death is to put put in the the uh, put yeah just. There's a conversations yeah conversations around subjects that may be too daunting, just kind of breaking it down, working through it um, together, and taking it out of the niche and kind of taboo into something a bit more. Yeah, I mean, would it be like a cat cafe where you got to actually in the cat cafe? <laughs> Would it work like that, a death cafe? Uh, anyway, but then anyway, those are some of the questions that remained unanswered in this session. Maybe we can, have, we can do that in the next session, which we're going to be here in exactly a month's time on the last Wednesday of, next, of March, which is the 25th of March. This is about, can you have more than one alter ego and you can just change and this will actually give you um, a change of perspective and maybe as a researcher that you guys were here for that one. So, uh, about, Is that the last one? Rick, uh, so we're going to use these images and kind of save them and come back with them next month with something a bit more. But in the meantime, I think it's time to get everyone's final thought, including those people that maybe contributed earlier. Um, maybe, come, maybe come through because we, we're gathering and garnering final thoughts now. It is all recorded and we're going to put this online for your, if, if you want us to, for your um, perusal and to show other people, to get other people involved as well. Okay, so I'm just going to gather the final thoughts from everybody, but thanks so much for coming uh, and sharing bits and bobs. Uh, Zavi, I'm not going to come to you, can I like, just chill for a moment, but I'm going to come to you. Um, Ava, Eve. Well, I was hoping to hear everybody else's thoughts because I've been um, working away and not really listening for the last hour and a half and in fact most of the, there's so many new faces here that um, so I guess it's been a really interesting discussion um, and that's what I can say because I've been about um, an hour and a half out of the discussion so I can do that's a final thought at the end. Okay that's fine we'll just generate some material for you Eve so then you can just pull from it so. You could do that excellent let's just do that so I'm going to go this way Lucia. Any final thoughts from you? Um, well, it's been such a wide-ranging wide discussion that it's hard to pin down one thought. But, um, I mean, I, I'm just interested in the idea of um, creativity uh, as a kind of group thing. That's what I'm coming away with more than an individual thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Xavier? No justice, no peace, as I began. That was the opening as well, so it's a nice kind of uh, coda. Um, I'm going to say something a bit... A bit 
related and unrelated at the same time, but just an idea of should a university be a political organisation or an apolitical organisation, and is it legitimate for a university to have political aims? Oh my days, this is like a new Tokyoki subject, like all in itself, so maybe we can pick that up next time, but thank you for this. Um, my thought is, can you blend your role as a researcher and as an activist? Are they the same things, or are they opposed? <laughs> Excellent, next Tokyoki subject as well. Um, so I'm currently doing research at the moment and I think what I'll take away is thinking about not only how the researcher can change what's going on but how what the person is researching can change the researcher but I'll be careful not to reflect too long to make sure it doesn't affect my productivity. <laughs> Good point. Uh, I thought it was interesting different things that were said about identity and the language and, and about the role of the researcher and how that influences the, um, the research that they do. So yeah. Thank you. Amit? I was just thinking um, the whole idea of final thoughts is such a sort of creative, art artistic kind of construct. Link, There's no yes. such... That, that, you know, yeah, yeah, you need a narrative, you need a beginning, an end, and a, a beginning, a middle, and then an end, I believe. And then, um, yeah, 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 final thoughts. You can't, yeah, mix it up. You can't really have final thoughts. I mean, this is it. I'm going to go away from here, and I'm never going to think about this again, because this is my final thought on the subject. Well, the thought is going to think you. How about that? That sounds a bit like the death theme. Yeah, well, guess who brought that to the table? Uh, right, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I just think it's been interesting kind of reflecting on, you know, tensions, really. You know, the subjective, objective, and I like this one as well about the political and the apolitical. Um, those are tensions, aren't they? Yeah. Thank you. I was just thinking about the pleasure of having a discussion with a range of people in public. So there's the sense that you're being slightly annoying, um, but that you're kind of, you know, how, how often do you, you manage to get just to talk to people in this fantastic sort of talkie pink table, you know, I think there's a, there's a real pleasure, I think that it's been, really, I think it's just been squeezed out of life, hasn't it, those kind of, those pleasures of just engaging and just talking and just kind of throwing ideas around, so thank you to Mikey and... Uh, I'm Margo. <laughs> well, if you are, uh, yeah, and if you want more of this, um, that we're, we're at the Science Museum tonight, so you can come down to the Science Museum, do some more, or Tommy Flowers Pub in Poplar That's on tomorrow. Thursday, uh, yeah, tomorrow, and Natural History Museum on Friday uh, in the evening in the Lair Late, and then Mars and Beyond, a sci-fi exhibition on Saturday. So there's plenty of chances to get involved if you want more of this. Talking to, to strangers and annoying them in public <laughs> is basically what we do every day. Um, and for, this perspe for this project, um, we get money, we get paid for it. It's well. unbelievable. Um, anyway, but for this project... I think what we want to do is try and turn some of these ideas into a proposal for an artwork. And for me, I think one of the interesting, the art police, however they're going to be phrased, not police, not police, I think that's a really interesting idea, is could you train up a group of pink-suited individuals to kind of make these spontaneous and in instant don't have to be pink. Um, spontaneous, but Rick did it in pink. Uh, spontaneous and kind of interventions connecting people together. Could that actually be a thing? All the time, Matt. Are the, they the integration between people, some of the things people do for each other is lovely. I mean, there's a general bad vibe, but most people are pretty good and pretty harmless most, and generous most of the time. I like this lovely vibe on which we will close this session. But before we do, I've got uh, uh, Eve. You've heard enough now to formulate your final thought. I'm buying you a bit more time. Uh, and now I'm going to pass the mic over to you. <laughs> Uh, it's something really hazy about agency and responsibility, which were the sort of themes at the beginning, and I think which continue towards the end. So, um, how we can all interact with our environment in a way that is useful um, and meaningful for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Give yourselves a round of applause. Uh, we've been the people speed. There was Rick on the visualizations. There was Mikey in the middle, uh, and there's me in the middle, but not for much longer. I shall pop out. So, thank you. See you next month, and let everyone know as well.